Yes and amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to continue talking about the gift, the process, and the room. But we're going to kind of take a little twist with it. The Lord has uh, laid something on my heart, and we're going to get into this. Amen? Amen. amen. Sister April, if you could turn, turn that off. I don't think I'm going to need it tonight. Amen? Amen. This morning in prayer, you, uh, you got to realize that a lot of messages that I teach are birthed out of prayer and intercession. And so this morning in prayer, the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about the condition of the body of Christ. And one of the things that he spoke to me this morning is that it, it's time for his people to dream again. Okay, y'all. I, I say it's time for his people to dream again. And some people are just sitting on pews, occupying space, waiting for the trumpet to sound, for the rapture to take place. Or, or some people are just like, whenever that time happened, God, I'll, I'll just I'll praise you for it, you know, whenever the breakthrough happened, whenever I step in the manifestation of what's been promised. But the Holy Spirit said that many of his people have stopped dreaming. And a lot of people may even be at a good place, but just because you're at a good place doesn't mean that's all God has for you. How many know that good is not best? And better is not best. But God say there is so much more. The Bible says that eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those that what? Love, Love him. Right? And that are called according to his purpose. Y'all know the scripture. And it also says in another scripture, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ever or according to what? The power that works in us. So all that stuff is based on what's working in you. What's working in you. And so I don't know how this is going to turn out tonight, but we're just going to follow the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Go over to um, Proverbs 29, 18. I promise you I don't have a script for this. Proverbs 29, 18. Some of you know this scripture well. Let me get out of the Amplified, which the Amplified is, is good, too. Maybe I need to read it in two different translations. Let's see here. Proverbs 29, 18. Let's read it from the NASB, and then we'll go to the Amplified. The Bible says in NASB, where there is no vision, say vision. vision. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no vision, one translation say the people perish. NASB said the people are unrestrained. The NASB said where there is no vision, and then it says no redemptive revelation. Now, what does it mean to redeem? To buy back. Where there is no revelation of you being bought back. Where there is no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, and enviable is he. So where there is no vision, people perish. No prophetic, um, redemptive revelation. One translation said where there is no prophetic utterance, the um, people perish. Meaning that there should always be a preceding word of God. And so I just want to ask you tonight, do you have a preceding word of God? Because if you do, then a preceding word of God is worth fighting for. It is worth fighting for. You, you don't let it go. And I told you last week that now that we have conquered some stuff and, and, and possessed some territory, that the Holy Spirit began to speak, that we have to pray for there to be an opening in this region so we can attract and step into everything that God has ordained us to step into. And that is the same thing about your, your life. The Bible say that the race is not given to the swift, nor to the strong, but he that endureth to the end. And you got to ask yourself, do I have what it takes to endure to the end? Because if you're going to endure to the end, one of the things that you got to solidify right now is that you cannot be moved by what you see. Because many times what we see is lying to us. It it is a direct contradiction uh, to the word of God. 
And so it's not given to the swift because I've seen people that have quick bursts. Yes. They, 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 they start out quick. They go out the gate quick, but they don't have the, the longevity. They don't have the stamina to finish. And, and the writer says it is not given to the swift or to the strong, but he that endureth to the end. That means you're going to have to get to the finish line in order to be a success. You can't quit in the middle of the race. And so we see two things. We got to keep our vision before us. And our vision is God's vision. We got to make sure that we don't let the vision slip. I'm talking about individually right now. Because what you have on the individual level will determine what you bring to the corporate destiny. And if you don't have a vision for your life, it's going to be kind of hard for you to uh, help us to fulfill the vision corporately because the corporate vision is always uh, inclusive of your vision. Everybody's vision should fit into the corporate vision. And so if you don't have a vision for yourself, then where do you fit in the corporate scheme of things, in the corporate vision? And so it's, it's got to be that we could keep the vision before us it's not given to the swift or the strong, but he that endures to the end. Amen? Amen. Say the end. Amen. Go over to Galatians. And I know many preachers read this when they're trying to get some money, but I'm not trying to get anything from you. Amen? Matter of fact, I'm not even reading this uh, within the context of taking up money. I'm, I'm reading this about your destiny. Galatians chapter 6, and drop down to the seventh verse. Galatians 6 and 7 says, I'm back in the NASB. Do not be deceived. First thing, don't be deceived. So the reason why he is saying don't be deceived, because being deceived is a possibility. Nobody tell you don't if do wasn't possible. So he said, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Say, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. That deals with anything. It's a, it's a principle. The, the, the law of seed, time, and harvest. Whatever you sow, guess what? You're going to reap. And, and most of the time we hear this within the context of tithing, offering, or giving. But I want you to see this in relationship to your gift, to your destiny, to your vision. Say, my gift, my, gift, my, destiny, my destiny, and my vision. And my vision. So whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. Verse number eight. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Now listen to this. Because it's hard to get a different picture because we've been taught in this particular scripture, that this right here means that I'm sowing to my flesh, meaning that I'm, I'm keeping all the money. I'm not giving God what's due him. And I'm not releasing anything. I'm just heaping it up to myself, which that is true in, in that aspect. But I'm talking about sowing to your flesh, not necessarily working on the fulfillment of what God has for your life. How many know laziness is, is sowing to your flesh? S much slumber. It's, it's sowing to your flesh. Wasting time, not being productive, is sowing to your flesh. So it's not just talking about taking money that I should be sowing and just spending it on myself and heaping it up. It's talking about not taking responsibility for what's in me and what's on me. Not taking responsibility for what's in me and what's on me. It is, it is every person's responsibility to cultivate What's in them? I'll say that again. It is every man, woman, person, responsibility to cultivate what God has put on the inside of you. Why? Because what's in us starts out in seed form. It starts out, say, seed form. But it is up to us to cultivate and to develop and to grow. It shouldn't be, still be seed form. It's a story in the Bible where there is a um, there is an owner of a vineyard. Y'all know the story. And this vine dresser is taking care of the vineyard, and so the owner comes and he said, "This this tree here." He said, "This tree, 
Every time I come, it's, it's the same. It's not producing. It's not growing. And so the vine dresser said, well, let me dig around it and let me dung it and let me work on it a little bit. And if it doesn't produce fruit the next time, we'll cut it down. And that, that was a, a parable about people's lives. Because when you get planted in God, you're supposed to grow and produce fruit. You're not supposed to be the same. Well, I don't understand that about the tree. Okay, there, there's another story about there are three servants that he gave different talents to. He gave one talent to one, to another he gave how many? Three, and to the other one? Five. And when he came back, the one that he gave five had how many? And the one that had three had? And the one that had one had what? He hid it in the earth. And he was rebuked and he was punished for not multiplying. Say multiplying. multiplying. You do know that that parable is not talking about money, really. He used uh, money or talents to get a point across. He is talking about what God has given you. I taught a, a, a series a couple years ago on capacity. Remember that? God deals with us based on capacity. Because what I think a lot of people overlook in that story is that he gave them gifts based on their several ability. How could he know my ability if he has not been watching me? So he watched them to see what they could handle. And so based on what he observed them handling, he gave them gifts. That's why the one that he gave five gifts to, he received a five, because he had watched him and said, man, he has capacity to handle more than the other two. And so the one that he gave the one to, he, he said he don't really do anything. So I'm going to give him the bare minimum and give him a chance to at least do something. And so God is watching to see what we do with what he has given us. It's amazing that all of them had the same opportunity. All of them had the same. Everybody starts out with the same opportunity. What you do with it will determine where you end up. And so if, if I sow to my flesh... I'm going to reap corruption. But the one who sows to, his, sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, listen, that's a capital S. That's not a, that's not a small S, right? It's not a lowercase S. In your Bible, is that a big S? Okay, so we know that we're not the big S. Anytime S is capitalized, in case you didn't know, it's talking about Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying if we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. Corruption. Say corruption. corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we will of the Spirit reap what? Eternal life. eternal life. Now, eternal life is not in the by and by. Get that. Please get that. The eternal life, how can I say this? See, we think that eternity starts when we get to heaven. Eternity started for you when you were created. <laughs> because everybody is eternal. Okay? Even the people in hell are eternal. They're going to be eternally tormented, but they're eternal. And the people in heaven are eternal beings. So eternity doesn't start at a certain time. It's already in motion. So Eternal life doesn't deal with a certain time. It deals with my life in this time. The quality of life, John 10 and 10, came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Well, that's part of that eternal life, which is Zoe. It is the God quality of life or the God kind of life. And so if I sow to the Holy Spirit, how do you sow the Holy Spirit? Well, you have to sow the things that Holy Spirit requires. What's one of the most important lessons that I can teach you about your relationship with the Lord? Learn what Holy Spirit requires. And once you learn what he requires, give him nothing less. Give him nothing less. Your, your, listen, your peace, your prosperity... And your positioning is all dependent upon you giving Holy Spirit what he asked for. It says, if I sow to my flesh, 
I'm going to reap corruption. But if I sow to, to the Spirit, Holy Spirit, then I'm going to reach eternal life. And so my eternal life, my zoe, my fulfilling of what God has called me to, is all dependent upon me giving Holy Spirit what he wants. So when he asks for something and I give that to him, I am sowing to the Spirit. Prayer, I'm calling you deeper. I'm sowing to the Spirit. More word, more study, I'm sowing to the Spirit. More committed to my house, I'm sowing to the Spirit. Stop making flesh moves and make kingdom moves. I'm sowing to the Spirit. And so when I sow to the Spirit, I'm going to reap this eternal life. But verse 9 shows us the problem with people continually to sow to the Spirit. Verse 9 said, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary or if we do not faint. And so the key to this is not losing heart. Why do people lose heart? The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. People lose heart when they have a certain expectation and it's not fulfilled. I'm expecting God to do this, and it doesn't happen. Or I'm expecting God to do this in this time frame, and he didn't do it, so I've lost heart. But the key to me reaping this eternal life is not losing heart, not growing weary. How do I grow, not grow weary? Well, I love God. It can't be that easy, apostle. Well, you didn't let me finish. How do I not grow weary? I love God. What's the rest of it? How do I not grow weary? I love God. So it doesn't matter what God does. It doesn't matter what he doesn't do. It doesn't matter if I think he's late. It doesn't matter if I think he abandoned me. I love God. And because I love God, I'm not going to get weary. Why? Because two things, he's not going anywhere, and I'm not going anywhere. How do you stay steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? I love God more than I love the world. I love God more than I love what God gives me. See, we were having a discussion at, at dinner um, before we came to the church, and we were talking about the church trying to be relevant. And I'm not getting into that. But what we were talking about is the fads and the, 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 the new stuff, the new dress, the new trying to draw people with, with, the, with fads and trying to be relevant but powerless. And the truth of the matter is, one thing has been consistent for over 2,000 years, Jesus. And I have found that people that love, see, we know God loves us unconditional. He agapes us, right? What is agape? Unconditional love. But do we agape him? Or does our love have conditions? Okay, it's getting quiet because I'm on the nerve. Because many people love God for what God can do for them. But they don't love God just because he is God and because he first loved us. And so we were talking about how people think that they're successful because they have the stuff. And so Mr. Jamel was saying the Louis Vuitton, the St. John, and all this difference. I said, hold up now, don't knock Louis because you know I like Louis Vuitton. <laughs> don't knock my Louis. I said, but what the problem is, the stuff has become the goal and not the reward. Wow. 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 The, the, the Louis Vuitton was never my goal, it's my reward. Wow. And so what we have today is a generation that want to serve God based on rewards and not unconditional love. Yeah. Because when you love, when you agape him, yes. you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Even if you feel like he abandoned you. Even if you feel like he could have prevented this. But because of agape, God, I trust you even when I can't trace you. 
I trust you and I love you even when I don't understand your move. I thought we were going right and you bust the left on me, but I still love you because you're God. Y'all remember when, when Jesus was having a conversation with his 70 people? Chastity, you remember this? And he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And they, they put that Baptist finger up and walked out. <laughs> I bring it to today's vernacular. They said, Jesus, straight up tripping. We ain't eating no flesh and drinking no blood. He was not talking about his, his cannibalism. He was talking about unless there's a deeper level of intimacy. Because yes. you, you've been coming to my fish fries because I cooked some good croaker. You know, but, but no, when you, see, you got to shift. Listen to what Jesus was trying to do. I hear you, Holy Spirit. He was trying to shift them from his hand to his heart. He was trying to shift them from his hand to his heart, and they didn't want to shift to his heart. They still wanted the fish fries. And he, he even said, he said, he said, the people don't follow me because they want what I say. He said, they follow me because of the fish. So the people was following him based on what was in his hand. It was not, it was not the love that he had for them. It was not unconditional. And unfortunately, in the church today, we have people that are pursuing God for stuff. And what they can get. And so Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no part with me. And so the 70 left. And he turned to his, his 12. And he, say, he said, you going to leave too? He said, have I not chosen 12, but one of you got a devil. So I really just got 11. And he said, y'all want to go too? Because he was saying, y'all can step too. Excuse my vernacular. Y'all can lead with them. Because I'll pick another group. We're going to get it right. I'm God, so I ain't going nowhere. I got forever to get this right. And then Peter said something that I don't think we understand. Peter said, where are we going to go? He said, you're the one that have the words of life. Peter like, we don't have nowhere else to go. Our very life is in your mouth. What you're saying is setting a course for our lives. So we're not going. We're not going to follow them. We understand this deeper level of intimacy. So the 11 apostles that stayed and turned the world upside down were following Jesus because they love him. Matter of fact, when Jesus was about to be on... Um, crucified, or after he was crucified, he asked um, Peter a question. He said, Simon, love us, I mean. He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, well, feed my lambs. He asked him again. He said, Simon, love us, I mean. He said, Lord, yes, I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Then he asked him again. He said, Simon, love us, I mean. He said, you know I love you. He, he, oh, what well, he say, Lord, you know. I guess he say, I ain't even going to answer this one. Because evidently, the answer I'm giving is not what he wants. He said, feed my sheep. What? He was like, you got to take care of the immature ones and you got to take care of the mature ones. You got to take care of the ones that don't know and the ones that think they know. And because you are dealing with rejection on three levels, I got to ask you three times. Because every time you denied me, you got a rejection seed in you. And because you're dealing with three seeds of rejection, I got to affirm you three times. And so a lot of people don't understand that Jesus was literally breaking the rejection off of Simon so he can be the one that stood up on Pentecost and said, oh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes it, it, it's not that you're bad. It's just something got implanted and it's got to be broken. And the way that it is broken is through agape, unconditional love. Lord, if you don't do anything else, I love you. If I never get the house on the hill, I love you. If I never get my dream mate, I love you. If I never get my dream car, I love you. Even if I don't get the promotion, I love you. And I'm not going anywhere because you first love me. If my spouse don't act right, I'm still going to love you. Because he said, love of me more than these. Do you realize the power in it? He was asking Peter, do you love me more than the other apostles? Love us, 
me more than these? You got to understand, they were on a level playing field. But it was Peter that got the revelation. Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. And it was on that revelation that Jesus said, okay, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of Hades will not be able to prevail or overtake it. Well, a lot of people say, well, he was talking about the revelation. Listen, baby, he was talking about the revelation and he was talking about the one that said the revelation. Because it was Peter that stood up on the day of Pentecost and and 3,000 souls got saved and added to the church. It was that rock that went through a season of denial and went through a season of rejection, but Jesus healed his heart. And he became one of Jesus' greatest leaders of all time. Why? Because he agape Jesus. See, when Jesus, Lord, okay, when Jesus resurrected from the dead and he, he sent them, you know, to get them, say, okay, I'm risen. He say, go tell the apostles or the disciples and Peter. Why did he say and Peter? Because Peter had excluded himself. Peter went back to doing what he was doing when Jesus found him. See, if you don't deal with those issues, then you will go back to what you were doing before he found you. That's why you got to deal with him. And so they, they got Peter and they brought Peter back and Peter knew he was forgiven when Jesus sent for him. So he was able to move forward from that point on. Why? Because he loved Jesus, but he just didn't have, he didn't have the boldness to say, yeah, I know him, which a lot of you probably wouldn't have said either. They friendly killed Jesus. What they going to do to you? Because I know I die for you, Lord. Well, let's try living for him. Too many lying church people. They're going to die for him, but they won't live holy for him. Because holiness is still right. So he said, don't get weary, y'all, in doing well. Don't, don't get weary in pursuing what God has promised you. You got two groups of people that get weary. I'm just flowing. I'm just hearing this. You got the seekers that get, <laughs> that get weary, those that have been seeking for a long time, and then you got the sellers. They are comfortable and settled, so they stop seeking because they don't, they don't arrive in their mind. And the truth of the matter is both of you should still be seeking <laughs> because we never arrive. I think I done, I done received all my promises. Really? Do you know how many promises in the Bible? So you got all, what is it, 680 promises? You got all of them. So you just chill mode. Or you done got weary because it ain't happened yet. And so you just done stop. I'm just going to serve them, but I ain't pursuing nothing. See, you, you done cast away your confidence. The Bible says, cast not away your confidence because it has great recompense of reward. You you don't have confidence in, see, you got to have confidence in your standing. Yes, that's good. I got confidence. I'm I'm, I'm a man of faith. I'm a woman of faith. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, we hear you. But do you have confidence in your standing? Because the Bible doesn't say, having done all prayer, pray. It says, having done all stand. So your your challenge is going to be in your stand. Not your praying. Yes. Oh, God. Do, do you get that? Yes. It's a, cast not away your confidence because it has great recompense of reward. So if I stand, even when I understand and love him unconditional, my confidence is going to produce the reward. You, you don't have confidence to stand. We sit when we don't see the manifestation. It's like worship. You can tell when some people get tired in worship. They sit down on you like they couldn't hold on two more minutes. They were about to get their breakthrough. Feet got tired. Legs getting tired. They, they, they sit down on you. That's how people are doing in their confidence. They sitting down. And they don't realize that like the lady that, uh, that, that, that her master uh, let her go to the, to the different men and they, they abused her and raped her and then they let her go and she came and made it to the threshold. 
And when he woke up the next morning and came out, he saw her dead on the threshold. What does that mean? She made it right there at the door and could not get the strength to enter in. A lot of believers are right there at the threshold, but do not have the strength or the confidence to just stand right there until the manifestation of what God promised happens. I'm not getting too much help right there. It's a having done all stand. Have you done all, first of all? That's a whole nother message. Having done all, I know you ain't done all. I ain't mean, I'm not even going to let you lie tonight. I know you have not done all. I cried. That don't move God. Tears may touch his heart, but obedience will move his hand. Y'all, I've been crying all night long, and that don't move God. God is not moved by tears. God is moved by obedience. So I know it's a heaven done all. Y'all know Ephesians 6. Saying, therefore, with your loins, you ain't done all. I know you ain't. I know. I know the flock. (laughs) At least the flock God has given me oversight over. I know in most flocks are like other flocks. So I know you haven't done all. That's why you're sitting down. That's why you're not standing because you haven't done all. Listen, you went as far as you think your understanding could go. But you didn't go as far as God told you to go. Because you felt weak. But he said that my strength is perfected in your weakness. He said, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Oh, you haven't done all. I just thought you wanted to know that. You, you, You haven't done all. Okay, go to First Kings. Y'all, all this was birthed 15 minutes before I came out my office. First Kings 18, 43. I was telling somebody that I was like, you know, I don't teach with notes. I teach by revelation. And they was like, you got to walk close with God. I said, I have to. I say, because if I don't, I'm going to be a fool. I'm going to be out here, I'm going to be dropped. Y'all going to be looking like, why he ain't saying nothing? He ain't got nothing to say. (laughs) First King 1843. I can't go on com and teach somebody else's message. I got to hear God because there's a progressive word because you never want to be what God said. You want to be where God is speaking. And anything that he said is just stay amount of the day. He said, give us this day our daily bread. So you want to be able to hear God every day. Okay, let let me read this. 1 Kings 18 and 43. Are you there? Now, let me set this up because I I, I assume everybody know the Bible like I do, but everybody don't. But the prophet Elijah, he he dealt with Ahab and Jezebel. And he told them it's going to be a famine in the land for how long? Three and a half years. And it's not going to rain but by my word. So that means nothing going to happen until I release the rain. So for three and a half years, they were in a famine, a drought, no rain. People panicking. Food is, is short. And so now Elijah is ready for it to rain. So we pick up here in 43. He said to his servant, go up now. Look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. Now, what did the servant say? How many of you have looked and there was nothing? Some of you looking now. And it seemed like there is nothing. Now, I want you to get this. He said, go look toward the sea. And so the servant went and looked and came back and said, there is nothing. Right? So we pick up, keep going, there's nothing. And he said, go back seven times. Seven is the number what? Completion, Completion, perfection. He said, go back seven times, 44. It came about at the seventh time, say the seven, that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand 
is coming up from the sea. Now, listen, what happened the first time? So what did the prophet say? Go back seven times. And then on the seventh time, he came back and said, there is a, a cloud coming up out the sea about the size of a man's hand. Now, a question, this is my, my, how do you see a cloud that small? Over the sea. Unless it's the hand of God, I mean, how do you see a cloud the size of a man's hand? But notice, the prophet said, go look seven times. He didn't see anything until the seventh time. Y'all know where I'm going with this, right? What number are you on? How many, how many times have you looked? Did you look one time and got frustrated and sat back down? He said go seven times. Perfection, completion. How many times have you looked toward your promise? And because you didn't see it the first time, you came and sat down and started pouting. You didn't see it the second time. You came back and said it ain't going to work. Then you got a little strength and you said, oh, I'm going to try it one more time. And you went and it didn't have you say, see, I'm through with it. You, you, like the, the, you like the woman who built the, the room for the prophet. She said, don't lie to me, man of God. But on the seventh time, he said, see a cloud about the size of a what? A man hand. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariots and go down so that the heavy showers does not stop you. Now, in a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and the wind, and there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went, went on to Jezreel. Now, listen. When the prophet sent the servant, there was nothing. Then he said, go seven times. When he came, he did not say it was raining, y'all. He didn't even say it was dark. He just said, I see potential. Y'all, y'all missed that. He missed it. I know you missed it. I'm gonna say it again. He said, I see potential. Yes. Say it's it's small, it's about the size of a man's hand, but it's there. Yes. Notice this. The servant saw potential, but the prophet saw rain. Yes. Because we would have been like, Sister Marquita. We would have been like, let's just wait and see if it's going to rain. Let's just hope and pray. We, we, we got a little bit of hope now. Just let's just see what it's going to do. No. The prophet said, go tell Ahab to hurry up and get on his chariot so that the downpour don't stop him. And when he said that, say that the sky got black and the wind began to blow. And then it began, the shower began to come down. Why? Because we get stuck at the place of potential. Because Elijah could have said, that ain't big enough. Let's wait till it get the size of a man's head or something. We're we not going to move with potential. But you will never see the manifestation of the promise if you don't start working with potential. It's amazing that when I look at some people, I say they just seeing potential. But I see a storm. The prophet can see farther than you. And the prophet can see what you can't even see for yourself. That's why sometimes we want more for people than they want for themselves. Why? Because you're looking at a hand and we see a storm. But because you will not move out and cultivate the hand, you never see the rain. Listen, he prophesied Rain based on a hand. This is, this is what I'm hearing. This is where the breakdown is happening. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We, we break down because we don't want to see potential. We want to see manifestation. And the manifestation is based on what you do with the potential. If you mishandle the hand, you will never get the rain. And you got to speak to the environment even when you just see the hand. Oh, 
oh, God, it's so quiet up here. You, I, I don't see nothing but a hand. I can't say, I can't tell the people it's from the rain. Oh, baby, it's from the rain. When I pray for people and they got a tumor and they go back to the doctor and they say the tumor is shrinking, I say, well, if it's shrinking, it's dead. Because anything that is, is alive don't shrink. So go look again. And they go back and say, I don't know, it's gone. What happened? Oh, y'all ain't going to talk up in here. Why? Because I'm not waiting. See, the manifestation is not in the cloud, it's in me. The potential is in the cloud. The manifestation is what happens to the cloud is depending on what I say, what I do. Because if I say the wrong thing, then the cloud can go back in the sea. But if I speak to the cloud, it grows into a storm. Because the cloud can't help us. We need the storm. Help me to get this. What are you saying? What are you speaking? See, the potential is there. But what are you calling into manifestation? Elijah said, go tell him it's from the rain. Uh, 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 ignorant assistant would have been like, now hold up now. I, did you not hear me, boss? I said it's a, it's a cloud the size of a what? I ain't say nothing about no rain and all that. You sending me to tell the king. To hurry up and go where he got to go because it's getting ready to rain. I told you I seen a hand. And the prophet is saying, that's all I needed for you to tell me. Amen. Now I got it from here. Yeah. Right. I got it from here. It's getting ready to storm. You better hurry up. You don't want to get caught in the downpour. But it's a hand. See, you're still looking at potential. I done shifted past potential. Now I'm tapping into power. Power going to bring this to pass. Y'all are really quiet up in here. I'm into getting this. Why was this so significant? And, and we're going to go to another script, but listen. Elijah dried up the land, and he had the key to water it. He said, it's not going to rain but by my mouth. So listen, he had already prophesied that the rain was in his mouth. He just needed to see a spark. Some of you not speaking when you see the spark. I thought that was it, but that must not have been the Lord. See, you already missed it. That hand done went back down. You got to strike when it's hot. And you got to be the prophet of your own destiny. Told you, you didn't look seven times. What do you say? You, you haven't done all to, all to do. You just doing part of it. You stay committed with it for a day or two, and then you go back to business as usual. Listen, persistence breaks resistance. If there's, a, if there's resistance in your life, the only thing that's going to break through it is persistence. Not hitting and missing, y'all. I'm speaking from, from a place of walking with God for over 30 years. And I'm telling you that if I would have been passive in my walk with God and I would not have been pursuing God and loving God with everything that is in me, I wouldn't be standing up here married for to be 31 years, walking with the Lord over 31 years. I, w I wouldn't be up here today. Amen. But it is, it is the persistence of a man that will sustain a man. And if you're not persistent, guess what? You're not going to last long. In anything. We, we got too many people that are quitters today. Okay. I ain't no quitter. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying we're in a generation where people will walk out of a marriage because they say, I just don't feel like I love you today. We grew apart. What happened? Oh, we grew apart. How you grow apart? Couldn't keep your hands off each other. Now you grew apart? I, I be honest with you, I don't like how she cook. <laughs> so you divorcing your wife over some grits. No, I'm, I'm talking about persistence. People, they don't, they don't stay in church long. 
They don't stay on jobs long. They don't stay in relationships. You know, they build in so many apartments now, they, they don't have enough land. Why? Because people don't want to commit to a house. I'm not going to commit to a mortgage, a mort gauge. You gauging it by my lifespan. Comes from mortuary. Do you realize mortuary and mortgage come from the same word? It means that it's not supposed to be paid for until you're about to die. Mort. Deaf. Gage. gauge. Deaf gauge. So we're going to give you a 30 year or we're going to give you 15 years. But it's going to take you the rest of your life. That's, that's the system. That's why we can't afford to be living according to the system. That's why you got to see a cloud. How many getting this? So as we go deeper, what are you, what are you doing with the potential? What are you doing with the potential? Man, I was on fire all week. I've been praying in my word. Okay, let's, let's keep it going. That, don't, don't stop. You ain't accomplished nothing. Let's, let's keep it going. That's the potential. That's the potential to walk long term with God. Let's keep it moving. Let's walk it out. Seek his face every day. Get in that word every day. Be accountable every day. I don't think you did something because you had three good days. Baby, this is a, this a marathon. This ain't no sprint. Let's go over to James. Am I helping you? Yes. I better be. <laughs> I better be helping. This is for who won it. James 5 and 16. Now, Elijah was doing something very specific when he sent his servant out there to look at the water. What was he doing? Well, let's pick up James 5, 16. Read from the Amplified Version. Are you there? Yes. Verse 16 says, confess to one another, therefore your faults, your slip-ups, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. We ain't talking about that tonight. And pray also for one another. If somebody do confide in you about their offenses, their false steps, their slip-ups, their sin, you don't go blast it to everybody. You're supposed to pray for them. That's what they told you. They needed strength. The strong are supposed to bear the infirmity of the weak. It ain't for you to put on Facebook, I know a certain sister. You don't say no name. Everybody know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, this is how we do, Sister Time. I know uh, it's a certain sister. I ain't going to call her name, but she had on a red blouse in Bible study last night, tonight. <laughs> and this sister shared with me. Okay, we looking around. Who? On the front row right there. Okay, I'll, let me get off of that. Pray for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Listen to this. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and there's dynamic power in this working. Now, let, I'm going to go over to, to the NASB. Because I just want to read 16, 17 in SB. Listen to this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effectual, say effective. effective. Say effective. effective. Now, what is effective? Productive. It, it says to the boiling point. Now, water boils at 212 degrees. Right? Some of y'all didn't know that. Well, I'm going to tell you. Water boils at 212 degrees. Ice is made at 32 degrees. So you have a boiling point, you have a frozen point. Then you have a vapor in between. Now, most believers are somewhere between 32 and 100. Lukewarm. We ain't got up to 212. Because the, the, it, it says that the, okay, let me, let me read, that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, that says prayers that are to the boiling point. Fervent prayer. To, fervency means to the boiling point. That means I can't say, now nah, lay me down to sleep. 
I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, that's what we were taught growing up. You're a child. So when I was a child, I prayed like a child. <laughs> but now you're grown. You can't be going in your prayer closet talking about our Father, which art in heaven. How be thy name. You ain't going in there saying that. That's the Lord's Prayer. Well, first of all, that's not the Lord's Prayer. John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. Read it. That is a prayer model that Jesus gave the disciples to show them a pattern for prayer. You've been walking with the Lord. You shouldn't be in there talking about our Father, which are in heaven. You had not collided with nothing. You haven't spoken anything into existence. Well, I'm going to pray the prayer of j -Bass. Well, you're not j -Bass. He'll bless you indeed, yes. He'll enlarge your territory. What are you saying? I'm saying that's not fervency. You know how you're on the phone with your bestie and it get good? And you're like, girl, I'm trying to tell you because they was doing so and so and you all into it. Why you can't take that energy into your prayer life? When it comes to prayer, you don't have no strength. But you want God to manifest. Let, let me read this. Let me read this. So, so the effectual prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. 17. This is where I want to get. Elijah. Say Elijah. Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was just a man, y'all. He was like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. 18. Then he prayed again. And the sky poured rain, and the earth produced fruit. What was Elijah doing when he sent his servant? The, the Bible says, that we would have read up above that, that Elijah was sitting over a hole. Stay with me. Why was he sitting over a hole? This is important, y'all. You got to get this. Because when women were giving birth in biblical times, they would squat over a hole because the hole would help pull the baby out. Gravity would take place, and it would be easier for them to give birth over a hole than if they were just laying flat. How does that tie into what we're talking about? Because when Elijah got ready for it to rain, he got in a birthing position. Oh, we got to go back over here because I ain't see that. Go back over to 1 Kings, y'all, as we get ready to wrap this up. First Kings 18 and 42. We'll start right there. You there? So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now, look, you look, I'm going to give birth. Oh, y'all, I ought to close my Bible right there. You, you go look, I'm going to push it out. I'm in the birthing position. I am squatting over the earth, and my head is between my legs because I am pushing rain out of me. Apostle, pray for me that I fulfill my destiny. You better get your behind over your hole. And you better begin to squat. And you better begin to push out what God has put in you. It's not going to happen by osmosis. It's going to be intentional. And you're going to have to get, see, you got to get out the parting position and get in the birthing position. Oh, God. I want it, Apostle. I want it so bad. I don't, I, no, you haven't, because I haven't seen you in the posture. That's it. That's it. There is nothing pretty about birthing. Especially when you got to be over a hole trying to push life out. And everything around you saying that it's a contradiction, and you got to keep pushing until you see the manifestation of what you've been carrying. Oh, God, y'all ain't going to talk up in here. 
Elijah say, I know it's in me. Because I already said it's not going to rain until I say so. So I'm about to push it out. But I can't just walk and look pretty in prayer to push it out. I got to get down in the birthing position. Because this ain't going to come out by acute prayer. This got to be travailed out. See, anything great that God has promised you, it's not going to be cute. It's going to have to be travailed out. You want everybody else to travail for you. You're going to have to get over your own hole. It's a, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The reason your prayer is not availing is because you're not in the birthing position. Birth pains hurt. Well, how you know? I have birthed a whole lot of stuff out in the spirit. There's nothing cute about giving birth. I birthed this building out in the spirit. I birthed the financing out in the spirit. I birthed the refinancing out in the spirit. There were demons that were trying to cause a miscarriage. Still birth. But you get in the position. You get in the posture to push. We got cute people now. Oh, I just pray in the bed, just laying, eat, kabo, shatabo, slot. Uh uh, baby, get out that bed. Get in the birthing position. Well, do I literally have to crouch? No, get on your knees, get on your face, get on whatever it takes for you to release what God has promised you. I'm showing you how they did it. If you feel like you need to crouch, crouch. I don't know what you need to do, but you need to do something because what you've been doing not working. You know, we can do a lot of things for people we love, but I have never seen a woman have a baby for her best friend, not unless she was a surrogate, and we ain't even trying to go there. That was just for the smart addict. That, well, you can be a I ain't talking about no surrogate. I'm talking about a woman that is nine months pregnant, and they say, tag you with to have this baby for me. <laughs> How many women say it don't work like that? (laughs) If you had a baby, do it work like that? Okay, who got to push that baby out? I've seen people that was getting ready to have a baby and grab their husband and say, stop it, I'm not having this child. You did this to me. (laughs) And they tell the doctor, no. The doctor say push. They're like, no, it ain't coming out. They're like, oh, it's coming out. You, You need to push. Talking about stop everything. I, I've changed my mind, baby. We admit the, the head is crowning. You ain't stopping this. What are you saying, apostle? You got to birth your own baby. Now, you might have some people rubbing your back. Might have some people praying for you. Encouraging you. But you got to push it yourself. Oh, God, this is. Apostle ain't praying hard enough because it ain't manifesting. Baby, it is not my responsibility to have your baby. I'm your Lamar's instructor. I'm telling you how to push. I'm telling you how to breathe. Oh, y'all. That's my job. If you need to say... Whatever you got to do, you do it. I'm right here with you. I hold your hand. I breathe with you. But I can't push it out. You're going to have to push it out. Mm. I'm out of time. Lord, have mercy. You know, because pastors get a rough rap. Ain't nothing happening. Pastor must not be praying enough for me. Uh, My season must be up. I'm going to go to a church where they're going to help me get my destiny. You're going to have the same issue. Ain't no church that great to have your baby for you. Stop blaming the church and take responsibility and say, I got to be honest, I haven't been over my hole. I've been praying cute. I haven't been in travail. You ain't coming into the delivery room with no sequence on, baby. You better put that. (laughs) 
to, sister tomorrow, too many cute people trying to deliver. Uh-uh, you put that ugly gown on. See, this is the thing about giving birth. Well, Apostle, you know a lot. Well, I've seen a lot of people in my life take pictures and stuff after birth, and I know that birthing makes you ugly. And there are a few women say, don't take a picture. Let me put my makeup on and stuff. And I'd be like, woman, you just had a baby. There ain't nobody thinking about your Mary Kay right now. <laughs> what? Birthing is ugly. Okay. You don't care how your hair look. You don't care about your makeup. You exposed and you don't even care. All the people in there. Just get it out. You don't care. And you ain't in there cute, you, ain't, you don't have anything on but a gown. <laughs> Nothing to hinder the process. <laughs> what are you saying that apart? Because some of you need to take some stuff off. I'm, I'm done. They, they say, shut them up. He was doing good. No, some of you need to take some stuff off. Some of you need to take off some relationships. Some of you need to take off some offense. Some of you need to take off some hurt. Some of you need to take off some wrong ideologies. I'm done. I'm not out of word. I'm out of time. I'm done. Praise the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Lord. I hope I honor.